so we were talking about this uh, uh, stick slip stick slip motion so normally if you see the stick slip will appear something like this coming down again going up coming down okay so stick slip happens basically because when the static friction is extremely high when compared to kinetic friction so if this difference is too much then stick slip will happen and stick slip will be uh, more pronounced when the stiffness of the mechanical system is low so it also depends on the uh, the system itself so for example any mechanical system can be represented by this for example by a spring and dashboard so if we have this uh, solid solid 1 and resting on solid 2 so there is some movement possibility of movement between solid 1 and solid 2 so, so this represents any kind of mechanical system and the mechanical system will have some stiffness which is given by k and some damping property damping property is given by eta which is the viscosity of this represents the viscosity so these two values k and eta will control how this uh, solid one is going to slide over solid two and it will also represent the stick slip part so for example if we increase eta or damp damp damping property then this can become something like this so instead of this kind of jerk or sudden change in the uh, displacement it can be a smoother profile so which will be a better uh, for example if you are talking about any kind of uh, machine or this can also be the amplitude can be reduced so amplitude can be reduced so the value of a stick slip will be reduced similarly if we increase the k that means the stiffness of the machine then again this amplitude can be reduced further so by um, by two methods by changing k and by changing the damp damping property we can reduce the effect of stick slip stick slip will still be there uh, but it can be uh, reduced and of course the first method is to uh, reduce the value of uh, mu s or rather make it more close to mu k so if mu s is closer to mu k then you have got better chance that means the stick slip will not occur so the stick slip amplitude uh, this amplitude should be uh, less than 10 to the power minus 2 millimeter okay so this amplitude should be as little as possible um, to reduce the stick slip uh, effect if um, this we can do by uh, providing a coating okay so if we have got one surface like this another surface like this and we can provide a coating on on one surface or both surface there are many kinds of very durable coatings available for these kind of kinds of tribological uh, applications any any coating you you know about for tribological solution yes. no sir but we hear uh, in drilling we use uh, some diamond coating what kind of coating sir diamond coating diamond coating okay 
Okay, so diamond coating is uh, also known as DLC. Have you heard of DLC? No. So this is called diamond like coating, uh, diamond like carbon coating, DLC coating. Okay, so DLC is a very, very popular uh, coating and uh, still not being used in all applications basically because the cost cost can be very high cost of dlc is very high but for high end application or for high uh, performance requirement uh, for example uh, um, cutting tools cutting tools are um, coated with dlc and uh, some bearings bearings as well as uh, uh, the cylinder and piston. So, so DLC coating is one, one thing. Another type of coating is also can be used is uh, MOS2, molybdenum disulfide. MOS2 also provides low friction and so reducing the friction as well as reducing this effect then another is ptfe ptfe coating is is used for this purpose so these are some of the trilogical solutions for um, many applications sir uh, you draw the graph uh, eta versus who Yes. You draw the graph with uh, eta versus you said like curves. Uh, eta versus yeah. mu. Uh, no, sorry. Versus what? Eta versus. Uh, yeah, eta is the uh, the viscosity, the damping. Damping. Action. Yeah, damping. Yeah. Versus what is the x-axis representing? Uh, here, here you mean. Yes, sir. Uh, here it's basically a time, x axis is time, and this is uh, amplitude. Amplitude of stick slip. Yeah. So, amplitude means uh, how much you are uh, seeing the uh, deflection in the system. Mechanical. Response. Sorry. Yeah, re response, yes. So, the more the amplitude, the more the response, and that means. Uh, uh, you know, the system is not good in that case. So another part is, uh, let me just delete a little bit here. So another kind of friction is experienced in rolling friction. So the rolling friction is obviously low compared to the sliding friction. So oh, it comes back. Whatever I deleted, it came back. By uh, doing undo, sir. Yeah, because of uh, I'm trying to write on this screen, so I'm not sure why it came back. Just now I deleted. Let me delete again. No, it won't delete. Okay. So when we are dealing with rolling friction then you have got one uh, solid which can be in the form of a sphere or a cylinder rolls on on the second second body so this friction is low very very low compared to sliding friction because there is very little uh, energy dissipation happening here so as I said, friction is a result of energy dissipation. So the energy dissipation is extremely low here because the actions that are happening, it doesn't involve any kind of plastic deformation. 
so no plastic deformation or no fracture so because of this the level of energy dissipation is is low so first thing that happens still we experience some friction in the rolling condition and one reason is because of adhesion and dehesion so dehesion is just a reverse of adhesion uh, this is not an english word but technically we use this word dehesion so in english dictionary you won't find this word so so adhesion we understand that when this point let's say this point comes at this point then there will be adhesion between s1 and s2 so this point will have some attraction to s2 and at the next state this point will go out of this context so dehesion so adhesion and dehesion so the, these are the this action happens another type of action that happens is elastic hysteresis elastic hysteresis is because uh, we are working under load so load is always there and some speed so because of this load there will be elastic deformation in the contact area so this is the contact zone and there will be some elastic deformation let's assume that s1 is extremely hard and s2 is little bit softer so there will be more elastic deformation in s2 part and this elastic deformation will be uh, released as soon as the this roller goes out of this contact so as soon as the roller goes this point this uh, elastic deformation will be released so that means uh, if you represent it by a stress strain curve so for example during elastic deformation you can see something like this and then during in a normal case there will be uh, straight this point will be traced here going back when the strain is zero but due to elastic hysteresis there will be a small amount of loss of energy this this represents the loss of energy okay so every cycle there is a small uh, loss of energy which is uh, represented as a friction and this will happen more if this solid 2 is uh, like elastomer for example like a rubber in the, those kind of situation or, or even plastics uh, the energy dissipation will be more and therefore you will have to do more work so for example if you are rolling this kind of uh, trolley on a hard surface like a uh, tiles then you don't feel so much of uh, force needed to move it but if you move this trolley on a rubber sheet or on a carpet soft carpet and you will find that you have to apply a lot of force to make this uh, this trolley move and that's because the elastic hysteresis is too much for rubber pad rubber or or carpet so you will have to do extra force so friction will increase there is a some work which uh, can also happen because of the plowing so plowing is basically for example if this roller is rolling on this one so basically it will form a kind of some sort of plastic deformation so if i look at the cross section then you can see something like this and the ball is rolling here so this is the plowing action that happens and plowing action has got some plastic deformation as well mainly elastic deformation but some plastic deformation can happen that means when the roll goes out of this uh, this place a mark will be left because of the plastic deformation so plowing action can happen then another is partial slip uh, can happen and because of this sliding is necessary so this basically happens again because of some uh, deformation of the 
solid 2. So for example, solid 2 may deform something like this, while solid 1 is, is here. So because of high stress, there will be some push, the material gets pushed up and because of this, it requires some slippage between the ball and the raceway. For example, in the bearing case, it is a raceway. So here also there is a friction and also in the case of bearing, uh, the contact area is elliptical and this kind of elliptical contact area also imposes different velocity and that also leads to slip. So slip also happens in rolling action and there is some amount of hub friction. So for example, if the if you have got this axle and uh, the wheel, so in the hub also there will be some, some amount of friction and therefore you need a, a bearing here. So for example, if you are on the road. So these are the contributions of energy dissipation to rolling friction and therefore rolling friction is not always zero is not zero it is much less compared to sliding friction but it is not zero so these two are very very important for us to understand what is sliding friction what is rolling friction because all the tribological solutions that we will discuss later or people are trying to find these are all based on this uh, the concepts as well as the concept of friction the static friction kinetic friction and how we can reduce this uh, stick slip behavior then third part of the friction is this one lubricated friction so here by lubrication we always mean that there is a lubricant in between so there are two surfaces but there is no contact between these two surfaces because we have provided a liquid in between and the better the lubricant is the better we can uh, reduce coefficient of friction in this case and friction will depend upon the viscous property of the lubricant or the viscosity of this lubricant as well as the lubricity okay, or boundary lubrication boundary lubrication property so these are the properties which will govern the friction in a lubricated contact so so this is different from uh, sliding friction and the rolling friction because in these two cases uh, the solids part uh, take part so these properties of these two solids are important whereas in the, in the lubricated friction as long as there is a full film then it is the liquid property that is more important. Now little bit about how we can measure friction. So in, um, in your schools and previous uh, studies you must have uh, seen this kind of picture to find out the coefficient of friction. So when you have got uh, one body here S1 and another S2 it is, it is called inclined plane uh, method. So here what you do is you put this solid on this inclined plane and then raise this plane. Raise this plane so that this theta increases from 0 to some value and the point at which it starts sliding is the point when you measure this theta and tan theta is given as the coefficient of friction and how we get it we can see from this diagram so for example the weight of this S1 is W here and the resolving W on this direction will be W sine theta because this is theta and W cos theta will act in this direction right on this inclined plane normal to the inclined plane and another is parallel to the inclination of the plane. So, so therefore mu will be W sine theta which is 
uh, at the point of sliding this will be the equal to F so whatever friction force is being applied is happening uh, at the interface so as soon as W sine theta just reaches F this solid will start moving therefore this will represent F this is friction force at the point of movement and so so this mu or the tan theta is actually the limiting friction in this case or we can say the static friction the maximum static friction or generally it is known as static friction so this is the point at which the movement will start so we can find out friction in this way static friction in this way the moment it has gone started moving uh, then you go into the mu k and mu k is less than mu s and therefore you see that this solid will accelerate in this direction it will go down because there is a force acting because coefficient of friction is lesser so therefore w sine theta is bigger than the friction force so that means there is a net force acting in this direction and therefore you see that once it starts moving it will not stop it will move very fast and it will go down so 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 we can find out uh, static friction here but we cannot find kinetic friction in this case because we have no way to measure mu mu k reducing or controlling uh, friction remains the main challenge of tribology so as we I have emphasized many times that uh, the tribology is all about friction wear and lubrication so friction in mo most cases we are trying to reduce friction in some cases we try to increase friction or control friction so either we reduce it or we try to control it control means we want a certain type of friction value for example if you are uh, talking about brake brake application although for braking application you will say that we need very high friction the higher the friction the better but actually it is not true because extremely high uh, friction coefficient of friction will not work in a efficient way so the coefficient of friction should not be extremely high normally it is in the range of 0.3 or something like this for brakes for other application we want to reduce friction to as low as possible even 0.001 or in that range so that is the tribology and about measuring friction we will uh, do the practical later maybe after two weeks uh, there is a equipment called pin on disc machine it's very very simple pin on disc machine or apparatus so pin on disc apparatus is used for measuring friction where you can measure both static friction as well as kinetic friction and it is basically like this a pin is there and there is a circular disc and the disc is made to rotate in this way so as it rotates the pin will experience some sort of force because of friction so friction will act here and basically you uh, with proper orientation you can apply or you can uh, put a load cell here to stop this movement and the force that you measure by load cell will be equal to the friction force okay so you can measure the friction force and how much load is applied is decided by you you can put a dead weight load or you can use some mechanism to apply some load so so f by w and as the disc rotates 
you can continuously measure friction force so that means you can continuously with time you can measure the friction force and normally if you plot time and uh, friction force for example so initially there will be some rise goes down and at some point it will just stabilize or fluctuate so normally it takes some time before it stabilizes this is known as running in so running in, in period is always there whenever you are uh, doing this kind of experiment and uh, one strong reason for running in is that this is a multi-pass uh, multi experiment that means on the if I'm looking at the disk like this and this is the wear track and a pin is here so the pin will continuously move on the same track so this is called multi-pass so since this is happening then it takes some time before uh, this initial wear will take place for the both for the pin and for the disk and in some cases some transfer of the material will take place some atomic scale or molecular scale transfer will happen and then it will stabilize so this is called running in and in fact running in happens in all kinds of machine so for example when you buy a, a bicycle when the bicycle is very very new you will see that some strange sound happens uh, all over the bearings bicycle is, is full of bearings there are so many bearings and you will see the strange sound happens and that is because the running in is happening and after a few days of uh, biking you will see that everything stabilizes the sound also reduces uh, and that basically shows that friction has come down to some stable value so initially it was high and going up and down fluctuating and at some point it has come down to a normalized value and it happens even for lubricated contacts so not just for dry contact for even for lubricated contact it will happen because even for the lubricated contact the solid to solid uh, contact still happens even though you have a lubricant in between the, the solid to solid contact will still happen so this kind of running in uh, transfer of materials uh, as well as some smoothening of the surfaces will happen so for example initial roughness was something like this and after the running in the, the roughness has changed so all these changes will happen during the running in so pin on this machine or apparatus is, is a more, uh, more uh, useful method than this method so this method is good for understanding to just explain this but in practical cases we use pin on this machine so we will talk about that one in the lab when we talk about travel sir, yeah sir this uh, disc rotate in here uh, yeah disc is rotating for example in this way oh in open atmosphere that yes uh, well, the machine that we have is in open atmosphere, but you can also make it um, uh, in a closed environment. So, for example, this is the pin on this machine. And you can design a chamber here. And it is a good point because for many research, you will need this kind of chamber and in this chamber you can have a, a gas inlet for example and a gas outlet for example uh, and also for example some depressurizing if you want to create a vacuum so you can do that so this enclosed chamber can sir, be uh, yeah sir will there be uh, uh, variation in wear based on which gas we are using yes yes we will talk about those things much more in detail so uh, there will be difference in uh, wear friction because 
as I said in the beginning, coefficient of friction and wear both are system properties. That means they are not strictly material property. Although materials play a very, very important role, we cannot deny that, but the environment plays uh, a equally big role. So we will talk about those things. Okay. Yeah. So uh, as far as tribological contexts are concerned, there are two types. One is called conformal and another is non-conformal. So conformal basically means when the radius of curvature of... Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Excuse me. Sir, uh, I have dot uh, in P non-disc yeah. measurement. Yeah, tell sir, me. Sir, for uh, obtaining friction, we require two surfaces, no, sir. Then interface will generate. Yes, yes. Sir, then one is disc and other is uh, air, which is found in... Uh, other is the pin. pin. This one is called pin. So you have got two materials, one is the pin, another is a uh, disc, right? Okay, and pin is, yeah. this is rotating? Yeah, the pin is stationary and pin is touching this disc. So pin is actually resting on it because we are applying some load here. So we have applied the load on the pin and there is a mechanism for this one. Uh, you will see in the lab, we, we, we have that practical on this pin on disc machine. So the load will be applied on this pin here. Therefore, the pin will be in contact with the disc, but the pin will be stationary. It is not moving. The disc is moving. So if I look vertically, as I, I draw here, vertical, uh, the top view. So this is the pin and this is the disc. Pin can be uh, spheric, uh, uh, circle or even rectangular whatever shape you want and because of the rotation of this disc the friction force will be acting the force will be acting here in this direction right the disc is acting here and the friction force acting on the backward okay so this force will will impose this uh, this pin to move in this direction because of the frictional force. So we apply a load cell here to stop this. So this load cell will stop the pin from movement and therefore the force that we measure by load cell is the friction force. Load cell. Yes. Load cell is a device for measuring force. You, you know about load cell? No, sir. No? You know wheat stone bridge? Yes, sir. Okay. So... In electricity. Yeah, in electricity. Yeah. So, so basically what we do is, uh, I'll just give a brief of what is load cell. So, load cell is basically to measure deflection and, and force. So, let's say if I have a cantilever type of geometry, okay, and if I apply some load here, so if I apply load, then this will deflect a little bit, right? This will deflect like this. So because of this deflection, there will be some elastic deformation here. And if I put strain gauges here and do the proper connection of Wheatstone bridge, then I can measure the elastic deflection here. How much elastic deflection is happening because of the load. Okay. So now I can calibrate. I can apply certain load and I can measure the elastic deflection and this elastic deflection is seen as a voltage, right? In Wheatstone bridge is, is measured as voltage. So load as a function of voltage and I can do the calibration and normally it will be because of the elastic contact, it will be a straight line, it will be a linear. So I can write an equation let's say load is equal to uh, some coefficient m voltage and plus c let's say we make it zero so we all we need to know is this factor if we know the factor whatever voltage we measure we can find out load by just multiplying the factor to the voltage 
So this is a kind of load cell. And there are many geometries of the load cell. So you can have a, a circular geometry where you apply a force like this and you measure the strains here on these surfaces. You need four strain gauges to make the Wheatstone bridge um, electrical connection. Okay, so that is the way to, ma uh, to make load cell. So normally what we do is we buy the load cell. We don't have to make it, but we can also make that load cell. So load cell is used to measure the force, which is the friction force and other parameters are imposed because we know the load we know the uh, know the velocity and so on okay so tribological contexts are of two types conformal and non conformal so conformal is when the two surfaces are of the same radius of curvature is same let's say flat on flat so radius of curvature is same it is uh, about infinity because they are parallel so in that case they are conformal or let's say something like this a ball in inside a cup they are both have got the same curvature so it is conformal but non-conformal is when you have a sphere let's say on a flat surface so the curv curvature of this flat surface is different than this one so therefore this is non-conformal contact even in the um, the bearings so the radius of curvature of this ball and the radius of curvature of this raceway are different they are not the same so therefore they are non-conformal contact so in a conformal contact basically what happens is that the pressure is minimized because there is a lot of contact area contact area is very very large or it is possible to have large contact area so pressure is low in a non-conformal contact like this one the contact area is only point there is a point contact here so that means for a point contact the load whatever load you apply the pressure will be extremely high it's load divided by the area and if for point contact if it is a very very small area the pressure will be very high therefore the chance of plastic deformation is very very high here yeah. so these are the important terminology we should know about tribological contacts regarding the friction measurement there are many other ways as well not only pin on this machine we can also have a, a actual journal bearing type and a plate on a um, cylinder and the, there are many different geometries sir we also use in fluid mechanics uh, to rotating disc and yeah. putting a fluid in uh, in what what experiment did you use Sir, uh, Newton's uh, low viscosity. Yeah, to find out the viscosity, is it? Yes. Yeah, to find out the viscosity of the lubricant or fluid, you can conduct that test where you have got two co-rotating cylinders and uh, uh, you can, uh, the inner cylinder will be rotated and the, in the outer cylinder you measure the torque. So, yes. The idea is the same, very similar. Now, since we have talked a lot about friction, so let's see the friction coefficient. So typical uh, friction coefficient of unlubricated material. So this is dry sliding, dry contact. At low speeds in normal atmosphere, that means just the atmosphere, against a mild steel counter surface. So as I said, friction is not a single material property it is always for a counterface so so that has to be there so so counterface is always mild steel and the other surface is these metals so let's say if this is the ball and this is the disc then let's say disc is always mild steel 
and the ball material is changing like this or pin material is changing like this so if you conduct this test mild steel on mild steel it gives you very high coefficient of friction 0.55 to 0.8 this is considered very very high and if you change the material to aluminium copper and so on coefficient of friction will go down another material called indium coefficient of friction is is very high with lead also it is very high okay phosphor bronze and brass okay so a coefficient of friction in dry sliding of 0.2 is considered uh, good lower on the lower side or 0.1 even better in dry sliding not not in lubricated in lubricated we need to go much lower than that and a value of let's say 0.5 is high friction this is also high friction so it is a relative term there is no absolute thing it all depends on your application so if we are looking for lower coefficient of friction we will use brass against steel against mild steel in this case mild steel but you can also use uh, alloy steel so that's why you will see most of the bearing materials or especially the journal bearing materials combinations are this one brass or bronze bronze also gives a low coefficient of friction here it's 0.3 so against steel and white metal bearing alloys i'm not sure what material it is uh, because this coefficient of friction is quite high then non metals so these are metals non metals for example brake material brake material is a composite is a is a very complex composite so brake material is higher coefficient of friction and carbon based material could be for example uh, cnt or graphite again these values are um, quite changeable depending upon the environment depending upon how we conduct the test one thing we notice when the two materials are same for example mild steel against mild, mild steel the coefficient of friction is very very high so this is very important to know that two similar materials will give you very very high coefficient of friction and especially metals but other materials also so um, so that is one very important thing other thing we should note is coefficient of friction is quite variable and even for the same material there will be lot of changes okay depending on situation so so we cannot say coefficient of friction is a fixed value uh, it changes for uh, for example by alloying you can change coefficient of friction so there are a lot of um, possibility of changes and one reason why these changes happen is because of the adhesion adhesion property 